with everybody and welcome. I'm glad that you are all here and I'm hoping that we can have a very lively conversation about what I believe to be a very important topic, why Jews don't cancel. But let me start by giving you my own ideological bias. When I write my uh, political autobiography, its title will be a wall on the left and a wall on the right, which is to say that when the Israelites were crossing the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea, when it parted, uh, we are told that the strong wind came and blew across the water and it created a wall on the left and a wall on the right and the Israelites walked through the middle. I therefore tend to define myself as a centrist Though in a politically overwrought conversation in America, I think it is fair to say that sometimes I am pushed a little bit to the left and sometimes a little bit uh, to the right, but mostly to the left. I define myself as a classic liberal. And what I mean by liberal is someone who believes in the freedom of expression uh, with certain boundaries, uh, someone who believes in the open marketplace of ideas, and someone who believes certainly in equal rights, both nationally and internationally. When we talk about cancel culture, we're talking about uh, a particular trend in American society, most often found uh, to the left, uh, but found as well on the right, in which people are afraid to express their opinions because they will simply, well, be canceled. Let me explain what I mean by this. In a Sapir journal, uh, which is a journal of Jewish intellectual ideas, the editor, Brett Stevens, the author uh, and columnist for the New York Times, who identifies probably as center right, talks about the action is cancellation. But cancellation doesn't simply mean losing a job, a book contract, a TV show, a speaking gig, and so on. It's more like erasure. A canceled person will lose not only his or her job, but also his career. He will lose not only his career, but also his reputation. He will lose not only his reputation, but also many of the people he once considered friends. He will lose not only his friends, but also in some cases, his will to live. And in this article in a Sapir, he tells the very poignant, tragic story of someone who, having endured all these uh, all these other trials uh, by fire then actually took uh, his own life. I shall continue. The broader impact is on a wider circle of people who fear that they too can be canceled at a moment's notice for saying or doing the wrong thing. It's what leads to increasingly widespread habits of self-censorship, speaking in euphemisms, professing views one doesn't really hold, pulling intellectual punches, or restricting candid conversations to a close circle of like-minded and trusted friends. I'm asking all of you to just ask yourselves for a second, how many of you find that you actually do this? It is why more than 60% of Americans admitted in 2020 that they have views they are afraid to share in public, and another 32% fear that their job prospects could be harmed by speaking uh, their mind. By the way, let me just say the following. I have uh, in my career, my full-time congregational career coming uh, to an end at the end of June, 43 years in the rabbinate, uh, I have lost uh, professional uh, opportunities uh, in some cases because I was considered too right-wing on Israel. In some cases, I was considered too left-wing on Israel and on American politics. The funny thing is, in some cases, it was by the same people. This is cancel culture a highly effective social pressure mechanism through which the ideological fixations of the aggrieved and truculent few are imposed on the fearful or compliant many by means of the social annihilation of a handful of unfortunate individuals. And as Brett continues and goes on to say, this is a threat uh, to liberal democracy. It is a tyranny of the minority over the majority it violates ordinary expectations of fair dealing. It represents an aggressive intrusion of political ideology into workplaces that were once mostly free from it. It seeks to prescribe not just certain types of behavior, 
but entire categories of thought. It requires public endorsement of a controversial set of ideas as the price that must be paid to gain admission, employment, promotion, and social respectability. Now, when I talk about cancel culture, I realize that there are many critics who might deride this particular term, and some would even deny its very existence. Now, let me explain how it plays itself out. As a centrist, I am quite fond of saying that it exists both on the right and on the left. Now, on the right, for example, in my wonderful state of Florida, cancel culture exists in the form of intellectual and literary boycott, as in banning certain books and certain ideas. On the left, however, it exists in the form of a soft censorship of views, loss of relationships, and as we've said, uh, professional opportunities and sometimes outright insults. Uh, or as I sometimes put it, people on the right tend to use weapons, W here important, people on the left tend to use words. Now, what I am interested in doing is figuring something out. I am interested in figuring out what, whether it is possible for us as Jews to have a particular way of responding to cancel culture. I open with the words of Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak Kuk, a Kohen, Orot HaKodesh, from his work, Orot HaKodesh, The Holy Lights. Now, let's understand who Rav Kuk was. Uh, Rav Kuk was the first chief rabbi of pre-state Palestine, which is to say he was the first chief rabbi of the Yishuv, the Jewish community in the land of Israel before it was declared a state. Now, he was, of course, an extremely pious Jew. You and I would call him a Haredi Jew, a so-called black hat Jew. Uh, he was also, in some ways, one of the great lights of religious Zionism and various family members made their mark in that. Uh, he was also a mystic. And he wrote these words. The defects of the world, both material and the spiritual, all derive from the fact that every individual sees the aspect of existence that pleases him, and all other aspects that are baffling to him seem to deserve purging from the world. This thought leaves its imprint on individuals and groups, on generations and epochs, Whatever is outside one's own is destructive and disturbing. Now, what you will probably notice here is that Rav Kook was describing not only cancel culture, but the proclivity of many people to live within their own intellectual and cultural bubbles. The paradox and the irony about Rav Kook is that while he was, you and I might say, rigidly orthodox in his thinking, he actually was someone who was extremely open-minded and believed that it was a mitzvah uh, for the state of Israel as it was emerging to accept, embrace, and to be nurtured by the contributions even of secular Jews. Now, what is the Jewish pushback on cancel culture? I would like to say the following, that Judaism enshrines argument and discomfort, argument and discomfort. There are some religious and spiritual traditions that have as their goal peace of mind and a kind of tranquility. I'm not, by the way, opposed to tranquility. I try to practice it myself at least every couple of months if I possibly can. But that being said, what is unusual about Judaism is that argument, discomfort, and struggle is very much a part of our religious culture. And it goes back as far as Abraham confronting God in the matter of Sodom and Gomorrah. It goes back to Jacob wrestling with the nameless stranger, limping away with a wound and with a new name that is the new name of this people, Yisrael, the ones who wrestle with God and with meaning. It's Moses with God and the Israelites, Moses arguing with God, arguing with the Israelites. We are now getting into uh, the uh, book of Numbers, Bamidbar, where the constant theme is the fact that our ancestors 
were royal pains in the tochus, and they were constantly rebelling against the authority of Moses, rebelling against the future, and embracing the past and saying, hey, Egypt wasn't that bad. Now, what happens, you see, is that we create a mentality based on being in Galut, in exile. A nation in exile is a nation that is not at home in the world. One of the things that I've written about, I constantly write about in uh, Martini Judaism, and this would be the cue uh, for me to uh, put in, um, if I possibly can, maybe I can, maybe not. Uh, this would be the cue for me to tell you how to access it, but it's religionnews.com, Martini Judaism. It's Jeff Salkin's column. One of the things that I write about a lot is that one of the aspects of Jewish culture is discomfort with the world, uh, that we are, in fact, the sort of people who are not comfortable. We want to create, as it were, uh, a way of living in the world that does not find itself susceptible to easy answers. That means that in the course of Galut and exile, as we move forward in history, certainly into the late 1700s, 1800s, and 1900s. The Jewish attraction to liberalism, broadly interpreted. When I say liberalism, I do not always mean a political point of view. I mean liberal as in open to ideas, open to discussion, open to conversation. By the way, as you will see, this is part and parcel of what we have inherited from the ancient rabbis. Talmudic discourse is a liberal discourse in that it often does not settle itself comfortably with a final answer. It likes the intellectual sparring match, which we need more of in America. And finally, what all of this results in, not the only thing it results in, is the Jewish attraction to irony and humor. This is the origin of Jewish humor and comedy, lack of being at home in the world, struggle, discomfort. I hope that you're making notes of your questions and comments because we will get to them later. How do we get out of this cultural morass of cancel culture? Now that I've shown you why Judaism provides an intellectual environment that is fertile and that gives us ways of responding to cancel culture, let me give you a roadmap out of this, what I think is an intellectual cesspool. I like alliteration. So I want to talk about the three C's. A culture of curiosity, in which you ask questions. A culture of controversy and a culture of compassion. Curiosity, controversy, and compassion. Now. Let me speak about curiosity first on an interpersonal level. It's really quite simple. How do we maintain relationships with people with whom we disagree politically? Let me be very clear. I used to say to my high school kids, my students over the years, the following words, which one kid, at least one kid, chose to make her motto in her high school yearbook. Your mind should never be so open that everything falls out. I believe that everyone in this class today probably knows what his or her red lines are, and we have them. I want to be very clear about something. When the right wing laughs derisively at cancel culture, it's not because they value liberalism. Be, let's be careful. It's not because they want to have an open conversation about the solutions to various problems, cultural, demographic, sexual, political. No, no. I am convinced that many of them simply want the freedom to hate and to be able to speak their hate out loud. So I am really not terribly interested in hanging out with those people, both people to my extreme right and people to my extreme left. But within those boundaries, I think it is possible to maintain some kind of relationship. And I recommend to you, if you find yourself in a situation 
where you want to or need to or would believe yourself to be intellectually nourished by people uh, who do not share your views is to simply ask questions. How about this? I'm not sure I agree with that position, but I am curious as to how you got to that position. Walk me through your mental process. Teach me your journey so that I can understand it. I am one of those people who believes in liberal conversation to such an extent that I've been known to recommend books to people with whom I disagree that I believe would sharpen their own opinions. Because I think we all have an investment, especially as Jews, in open conversation and intellectual discourse. Or let me put it to you this way. We Jews are sometimes, rightly or wrongly, sometimes lovingly and sometimes with a little bit of cynicism, referred to as the, the most intellectual quadrant of the American public. It was exactly 90 years ago, two weeks ago, uh, when there was the massive book burning at Humboldt University in Germany, which was then repeated all across Germany. What was it that Joseph Goebbels said? As the books were in flames, he said something along these lines. The era of extreme Jewish intellectualism is now at an end. This is what our enemies believe to be true of us, that we are extreme intellectuals. Dare we disappoint them? Number two, a culture of controversy where we can disagree. And number three, a culture of compassion. It is my goal uh, to show you how that, in fact, uh, plays out. A culture of controversy. We have this classic text from Avot, Pirkei Avot, which, by the way, we have been reading in the synagogue in the, this period of Svirata Omer, the counting of the Omer, the period between Pesach and Shavuot. Every dispute, every controversy, every machloket that is for the sake of heaven will in the end endure. But one that is not for the sake of heaven will not endure. When I say for the sake of heaven, the shem shamayim, what I merely mean is this. Any controversy that is sacred, any controversy that is about the aspects of the holy in our lives. The word for controversy or dispute is machloket, and it comes from the root chalak, chalak, a partition, something that is not whole, something that has sections to it. What kind of controversy is for the sake of heaven? That was the controversy of Hillel and Shammai. Now, in the early generation of the sages, we had two, they're called schools, but two camps of sages, the Hillel guys and the Shammai guys. In almost every particular machloket between them, in terms of what Jewish practice would look like, the one that wins is always Hillel, which, by the way, uh, has caused me to fantasize about raising money uh, for a counter Jewish student organization on the campus that would be called Shammai. So these were conversations in which these two groups argued with each other, but they did not come to blows. There was no violence between them. And what is the controversy that was not for the sake of heaven? The controversy of Korach and all his congregation. Now, when we say his congregation, Adato, his group, we find this several weeks from now, again, in Bamidvar in the book of Numbers, where Korach leads a rebellion against the authority of Moses. But what becomes clear is that there is no real issue here. There is no real driving point. There's no real intellectual issue that Korach brings to the table. It's merely this, I want power. So in other words, a sacred controversy is one which we're talking about the holy. An unsacred controversy is one which is only about jockeying for power and control. Now let's study some Talmud from Eruvin 13b. 
Rabbi Acha Bar Hanina said, it is revealed and known before the one who spoke in the world came into being, that would be God, that in the generation of Rabbi Meir, there was no one of the sages who is his equal. He was so brilliant that he could present a cogent argument for any position, even if it was not consistent with the prevalent halacha, as he would state with regard to a ritually impure item that it is pure and display justification for that ruling. And likewise, he would state with regard to a ritually pure item that is impure and display justification for that ruling. Here we find a great love and admiration and affection for Rabbi Meir, who was able to make different sides of an argument and could actually find the inner contradictions within his own arguments. Now, about this dispute between Shammai and Hillel, Rabbi Abba said that Shmuel said, for three years, Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel disagreed, these two parties, as it were. These said the halacha is in accordance with our opinion, and these said the halacha is in accordance with our opinion. They disagreed. Ultimately, a vo divine voice emerged and proclaimed both these and those are the words of the living God. However, the halacha is in accordance with the opinion of Beit Hillel. The Gemara asks, the comment now says, since both these and those are the words of the living God, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. These and these, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim, are the words of the living God. Now, I want to... I want to drill down here. It's a very famous statement. And sometimes it is used to simply say, ah, right, there's no truth. Okay, you got your opinion. I got my opinion. The words of the old pop song, you say tomato, I say tomato. But we don't call the whole thing off. We live in a community here. But it's very interesting that while they cannot agree, a divine voice comes and says, both of these are the words of God. But the halakha, the way you live, is in accordance with Beit Hillel. Now, that's an interesting paradox. Both of these opinions come from God. How can they both be right? They might both be right, but in the real world, we can only live with one set of laws. Or let's put it this way. Let's relate this to American history. I think it would not surprise you to know that there are many voices within American history. The founders did not speak with one voice. In fact, by the way, it is possible to say, looking at the broad sweep of American history, that different regions of the country had different interpretations of what America would be. Or let me just be very simple and almost simplistic about it. The Northern narrative and the Southern narrative were, and by the way, are still different ways of looking at the American reality. However, we still have one set of laws. We don't get to say, you live your way, I live my way. We can live philosophically in two worlds, but in real life, we have to live with one. And more than that, these are the words of, look at this, the Elohim Chayim, the living God. It could have said, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim. Both of these are the words of God. Instead, it says Elohim Chayim, the living God, because we know that God is alive, because we're able to disagree with each other. Rabbi Meir had a disciple, and his name was Samahus, who would state with regard to each and every matter of ritual impurity, 48 reasons in support of the ruling of impurity, and with regard to each and every matter of ritual purity, 48 reasons in support of the ruling of purity. In other words, he was able to make the arguments going back and forth. Now, when we talk about this culture of controversy, I want us to understand how this plays out in our real lives. And I want you to think for a moment about whether you have friends or colleagues or relatives with whom you disagree on political and cultural issues and what it means to live in relationship with them. This is a very powerful text. Uh, 
comes from the section of the Talmud, Bava Metzia. And it's about a couple of sages. There was Reish Lakish, who was really the bad boy of the Talmud. He actually started life as a gladiator and as a highwayman. He was, he was tough. But he became a great scholar. And his good buddy, Rabbi Yochanan. Rab, Reish Lakish died, and Rabbi Yochanan grieved for him greatly. The rabbi said, what can we do to restore his peace of mind? Let us get Rabbi Elazar ben Pedat and place him before Rabbi Yochanan. In other words, let's get Rabbi Yochanan another buddy, another study partner, another friend. They brought him and seated him before him. You can imagine that it's Shiva. They bring him to the house and they say, Rabbi Yochanan, we know that you're very upset that Rish Lakish has died. We'd like to introduce you to your new friend, Rabbi Elazar ben Pedat. For every issue that Rabbi Yochanan mentioned, Elazar ben Pedat said, there's a teaching that supports you. Rabbi Yochanan said to him, do I need this? When I made a statement, Reish Lakish would object with 24 objections, and I would solve them with 24 solutions, and thus our traditions expanded. But you say there is a teaching that supports you. Don't I know I speak well? Notice what Yochanan says. This is amazing. They bring him a new friend who agrees with him all the time. And he says, what the hell? Look? I don't need you. Rachel Lakish. When I said something, he gave me 24 reasons why I was wrong. And then I would solve them. And look at the what, what the sum total of this was. And thus our traditions expand. Judaism got bigger. But you say there's a teaching that supports you. You think I don't know that? Of course I know that. What, what? I don't need you in my life. He tore his clothes and went crying at the gates. Where are you, son of Lakish? Where are you, son of Lakish? Where are you, Rach Lakish? I miss you until he lost his mind. He sank into a, a deep, dark, dismal, deathly depression. The sages prayed for him, and he died. What a poignant story. The best friend, the best friend that he missed that he couldn't live without was the one who disagreed with him. So we have a culture of curiosity. How'd you get to that position? We have a culture of controversy, okay? Elu the Elu. I need to learn more about this. I need your opinion. I need your opinion that differs from mine because maybe I will grow from it. But now we need a culture of compassion. I disagree with what you say, but we're still friends. I think she's wrong on this issue. But there are other issues on which we agree. I have friends and colleagues, sadly, who have canceled their subscriptions to magazines so they don't go on certain websites. I read an article I disagreed with by an author I disagreed. That's it. I'm that's it. I'm done. Whatever happened to eh, I didn't like that article. Maybe I'll like one better this week. Whatever happened to boy, do I disagree with this guy. In fact, sometimes I think that he's a jerk. I, I, I but whatever happened to the idea that we can still be friends. Let me tell you this story. A culture of compassion. The story of Gershom Sholem and Hannah Arendt. Gershom Sholem and Hannah Arendt were two of the most important Jewish intellectuals of our time. On the left, Gershom Sholem, born in Germany, his name was Gerhard. 
He converted to Zionism as a young boy. The family was so assimilated, you'll love this, that his father got him a gift of a portrait of Herzl. That's the good news. The weird news is that it was a gift that he gave him on Christmas. The elder Sholem, Gershon's father, Gerhard's father, was so assimilated. This is a weird kind of assimilation. He would light his cigar off of the Shabbat candles and say, Bore pre tobacco. That's a smart kind of assimilation. Sholem is known to all of us or many of us as the foremost scholar of Jewish mysticism. Some of his ideas have been challenged over the last uh, 40 years or so, but he remains in the canon. And then we have Hannah Arendt, also a German Jew, a political philosopher, a very controversial, problematic person, not least of which because she had a decades-long love affair with the philosopher Martin Heidegger, who himself had a love affair with the Nazi party. Two very formidable people. They had a correspondence that went on for decades, a real correspondence, the kind that you did with pens and typewriters. And it reached its climax in 1963. The year before that, the New Yorker magazine had sent Anna Arendt to Jerusalem to cover the trial of Adolf Eichmann, the horrific Nazi war criminal who was the architect of the final solution. Hannah went to the trial. By the way, there's a movie based on this. It's on Netflix. It's quite good. She covered the trial, and the coverage became a series of articles that was in the New Yorker that became her most famous book, Eichmann in Jerusalem. Now, the book was problematic for two reasons. First, there was the way that Hannah Arendt portrayed the monster Eichmann. She saw him as a merely boring bureaucrat. By the way, fun factoid, Another person who attended the Eichmann trial, who wrote his own impressions, however, in poetic form, believe it or not, was the late Canadian singer, songwriter, poet, Leonard Cohen. The second reason why the book was problematic was because Hannah had a very judgmental attitude towards the Jews who served on the Judenrat, the Jewish councils in the ghettos, in Warsaw, in Vilna, in Lodz. In so many ghettos, that what happened was that the Nazis forced the leaders of the community to serve on the Jewish council, the Judenrat, and they forced them to obey their orders and to collaborate in the deaths of their fellow Jews. And then afterwards, they themselves were killed. And she was very judgmental towards those Jews. And these depictions infuriated Gershom Scholl. And this is what he wrote famously to Hannah Arendt about her reportage. It is the heartless, the downright malicious tone you employ in dealing with a topic that so profoundly concerns the center of our life. There is something in the Jewish language that is completely indefinable, yet fully concrete. What the Jews call Ahavat Yisrael, or love for the Jewish people. With you, my dear Hannah, there is no trace of it. Basically, he was saying you're a self-hating Jew. And she hits back. The magnificence of this people once lay in its belief in God. And now this people believes only in itself. What Hannah was saying is, I don't love the Jewish people because the Jewish people is not an entity that I can love because it can't love me back. Interesting philosophical move. I don't love the Jews, nor do I believe in them. I belong to this people in nature and in fact, and they went back and forth with each other. Really vitriolic. But you know what finally happens? You're going to love this. 
On September 14th, 1963, Hannah wrote another letter to Sholem. She said, you misunderstand me. You must understand my work, my ideas, my passion. You don't get my life. It was a really harsh letter. And this is how she ends it. Not said with snark. Their friendship endured. Now, before we go to questions, I'd like to share with you a recap. The Jewish way out of cancel culture is a culture of curiosity. How'd you get to that position? Of controversy. We're not going to agree. And compassion, I think we can maintain a relationship despite it all. But I want to end with the words of the great late lamented Israeli poet, Yehuda Amichai. This, by the way, has been turned into a song. The Makom Asher Anu Tzutkim, in the place where we are right. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. That our doubts and our loves dig up the world. It, 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 it contributes to the turning over of the soil. It makes the land more fertile. And what's the ruined house? In Hebrew, Habayat HaNechrav often refers to the ancient temple, a place of unity where we can still hear the whispers of who we are. The way we get rid of cancel culture, curiosity. How'd you get to that place? Controversy. We're not going to agree. Compassion. We can still be friends. I thank you all. Thank you. Terrific. A great message for today, a great message for our time. So um, chat is open for people who want to ask questions. And um, I have a few already. Uh, I'll start with what Martha Rainey uh, said, which is something that people may not know about, was that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was actually very friendly with Antonin Scalia. So it's an interesting example of people from very different um, sides of the as, spectrum. As, the was Ted, as was Ted Kennedy, very friendly with Orrin Hatch, as in their post-presidencies, Bill Clinton has become very friendly with George W. Bush. I don't want to be friends with people I agree with all the time. I think that's a little boring. That's just me. Thank so you. that was a nice thing to add. And then also, you know, in Judaism, we have the Chevruta model where you study with a partner. And that partner exactly. is supposed to push you. So that fits everything that you were Good. teaching us today, right? Absolutely. And push you and... You know, I'm not a big fan of Hebrew to learning. I'm I'm a, I'm a much more frontal learner. That being said, I will tell you that in my relationships with colleagues, informally and formally, in Hebrewta, you know, it comes from the word chaver. The word chaver is a great word. It means friend. But there's something else about the word chaver. I'm going to type this into the chat because um, I want it's fun with Hebrew. Chaver, which means friend is related to the word machberet, which means notebook. And some friendships are like loose leaf notebooks. You open up the pages and you pull them out and you put them back in, maybe in a different order. But I believe that many friendships should be like those black and white marble notebooks, where if you tear out one page, the whole thing falls apart. It's important to have relationships where we don't agree with each other all the time. Let's keep it going. Brian asked the question, but I think you kind of addressed it, which is what about um, limits? So, you know, I don't think you have to be friends with a racist or, or a vehement anti-Semite, right? So you, you can, and I think you mentioned that, that there are extremes, but there, but between those extremes, there's a very broad section of people that you can remain in conversation with, correct? I think that's absolutely right. Now, the truth of the matter is that we all have our moral and even our aesthetic limits. Um it's interesting. I was contacted by a, a, an old high school friend with whom I had reconnected on Facebook. And I think during the 2016 election, he and I had a falling out about the election. 
Uh, we hadn't spoken since then. He was coming to town to visit his kids, and he sent me a text, uh, and he said to me, um, I'm wondering uh, if we could have a drink, because I didn't like the way we left our last conversation. And we got together, and he's a pretty blue-collar guy, and you know some of his opinions might be considered outside the pale for many of us. He's kind of a ma mega Republican, and there may be some of those on our call, and call a vote. Uh, and I applied my principle of tell me how you got to your opinion. And then I said, I think we're not going to agree here, but let's, but we talked about TV shows and music and we found stuff that we can't agree on. However, let me say this, racist, bigots, people who are haters, it is not a mitzvah to agree with them. I will, however, say something else, especially in the Zionist conversation, um, uh, I have had some extremely important conversations uh, with people on the extreme left and on the extreme right in the Israel conversation, where I really existentially disagree with those people. And I found that I have agreed, I have not agreed with them, but I've come to grow from that. We need this churning in order to grow. Racists, bigots, people who hate Israel, people who hate the Jews, people who hate black people who hate... There's a difference, by the way, between hating and I disagree with what the proper approach to this social problem is. That's a very, very big difference. And unfortunately, we sometimes take the express lane with the people we disagree with, and we imagine that they actually believe worse things than they actually do believe. And we need to talk more with those people. Let's keep it up. So here's a CSP real world example. Someone, I, I had uh, uh, lunch with someone to get some ideas for future speakers. And they mentioned a, per a person's name and they said, well, that person's kind of on the outs right now because they were in the news for being a very like um, unpleasant person to work with. I don't think they crossed the line, but they were, they, they, they harassed their people that they worked with. There was articles written about the person, but this is like very well-known person who's written great books. Maybe you should think about bringing them back to talk about one of their books. So what do you do in that case? Um, imagining who the person is, I will simply say this. Um, I My own personal policy is, unless a formal charge has been brought by a rabbinical organization, I dismiss much of this stuff as Lashon Hara. Not everyone will agree with me. I sometimes find the curating of these conversations to be uh, to be counterproductive. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the way the blogosphere works and the way that the internet works, et cetera, it's gotten worse and worse now. If there are credible accusations that are actually brought through a rabbinical as association and not merely whispers, and being a difficult person to work with is an incredibly objective thing. I'm sure there are people who find me to be difficult to work with, and we all have our bad days. Uh, that does not necessarily make this person into, God forbid, Harvey Weinstein or whatever. So we... We have to be very, very careful. By the same token, I also know that I say these words, I hate putting it this way, out of a position of privilege. I'm a man. I have the luxury, you might say, of not taking this seriously. I do take it seriously. I do take these accusations seriously. But the problem is that we need some kind of credible process by which people are accused and then are judged, if not by a jury of their peers, and certainly by their professional organization. That's a very, very sensitive issue. I would be very sad if ideas that are very important get censored because people are difficult people. Hmm. Let's go to another. I could, be, I could be wrong. Right. We'll go to another easy topic. So I, I think in many respects, Israel itself is canceled with regard to synagogue discussions. I don't know about your synagogue, but I'd be interested to find out. How do you get up on the Bema in a respectful way and talk about Israel um, when you don't agree with something that the government has done or is doing? Particularly, I mean, it's in the news right now, given the judicial reform. 
A lot of people are very unhappy about that. But a lot of people also don't want to hear any criticism on Israel from the Bema, from synagogue or in synagogue. And yet, so in my from my perspective, hasn't Israel been canceled? Isn't it like a topic you can't discuss? Or how do we discuss it? How do we bring it back to the model you just brought us to have a discussion? Well, there are a couple of things. First of all, I just wrote about that today. My most recent column is on Yerushalayim and why Yerushalayim is in the plural form, the earthly Jerusalem and the heavenly uh, Jerusalem. Uh, I, my, my attitude towards this has evolved. And some people will disagree with this. Number one, I am more likely to say controversial things in a class whereby people can respond than from the pulpit, where it's a one-way conversation. Number two, when it's a one-way conversation, uh, I need to make sure that what I'm saying is rooted in Torah and rooted in Jewish values. And number three, I also need to make sure of something else. The problem with the Israel conversation is that too much negativity and too much critique might make the preacher feel good, but it disempowers and depresses people in the congregation. It's not that you shouldn't criticize Israel. It's that it is actually, um, it's, it's, it's actually um, counterproductive. It disempowers, it depresses, and it demoralizes. So what I have done in talking about what's going on in Israel in terms of the judicial reforms, etc., I've discovered that this is over the heads of 80% of my people. Mo we have to understand, with the exception of all of you, you'd be shocked how few American Jews have actually visited Israel at least once. I will give you a statistic. Of the major diaspora communities, Canada, United States, Britain, France, Argentina, Australia, the lowest percentage of diaspora visitors to Israel has come from the United States. We are connected through nostalgia. We're connected through whatever. It's not a living reality for many of us. So when I do preach about Israel lately, what I've taken to talking about are the crowds of Israelis, now almost 15% of the Israeli populace, who've taken to the streets who have said, this is our Zionism. This is what we believe. I preach the positive rather than criticism because there's nothing we can do about it except making sure that when we give money for example we give to money to ngos that support our views supporting our own movements reform conservative whatever uh in israel then it's helpful you can't i can't i don't give people things to be upset about that they can't do anything about now when it comes to american politics my own position is simply this. I deal with the P's. I don't mention people. I don't mention parties. I don't meet, mention politics. I talk about principles and philosophy. So yes, I do mention what's going on in my state from the pulpit. I don't mention the name of the governor because I don't want to be accused of being partisan in terms of politics. But I do talk about what are the Jewish values that are at stake here. And that's important for people to know. Thank you. Let's turn to campus. I don't know what's going on these days on campus, but we've had a history of, I think, well, we know that there's a lot of anti-Israel um, program speeches, activities on campus. Certain campuses are worse than others. Um, and from your perspective, how, how should, whether you're a student or someone in a community, address that situation given the framework you just gave us um i don't i don't i personally don't believe that everybody who's anti-israel is an anti-semite i think some people are anti-israel because they don't agree with israeli policies i'm not saying they're right but but that you know that's their position um they may be fighting for certain rights that um from their own culture um, and yet we have a big issue and it seems like particularly on campus um we don't have these discussions we're not 
we don't have to agree with these people. They don't have to agree with us, but it seems that we try to cancel each other out. Well, it's interesting, Ari, you and, you and I, you know, we're, we're, we're going to probably disagree with this. If we had more time, I'd ask you how you got to that position. Uh, but I actually, let me say this. I make a distinction, whether it's on the college campus or elsewhere, between people who disagree with Israeli policies and people who think there should not be in Israel. I also actually would disagree within the American Jewish community between anti-Zionism or non-Zionism and uh, people who th don't think there should be in Israel. Or let me put it to you this way. On May 13th, 1948, the anti-Zionist position, I do not believe in Israeli sovereignty. I don't, I believe that Jews should not demonstrate a dual loyalty, the position of the American Council for Judaism, which of the Reform Rabbinate, that was an entirely kosher position. By May 15th, 1948, it had become irrelevant because the state was already created. So I distinguish between people who think that Israeli policies are wrong, the Israeli government is bad, I wish Israel would do better with the Palestinians, with the Russians, with women, with Israeli Arabs, with the Mizrahim. I, and I, I say to people, you know, I during the years of 2016 to 2020, I didn't walk away from America. I distinguish between the different uh, those people who, by the way, disagree with the occupation. Uh, a, a very funny story. Uh, years ago, I came back from Israel. I presented my passport to passport control at Kennedy Airport, and uh, the officer behind in the booth looks at my passport, looks at me, and says, "Occupation." I said, "Don't get me started." Um, but the point is that, and those who are opposed to the settlements, why should Israelis have all the fun? Have at it. My red line, and getting back to that theme, Ari, is if you think there shouldn't be an Israel because of the things that Israel has done, then I would just want to ask the question, what other country do you believe should not exist because of the stuff that it's done? And if you can't name one, not you personally, if you can't name one, then you might be a little bit, uh, well, let me say this. I don't like calling anybody an anti-Semite. When I worked for the ADL with the indefatigable, in incomparable Abe Foxman, he said something very important. He said, never call someone an anti-Semite. Number one, that's like drawing a gun. Number two, you don't know what's going on in that person's soul. Number three, you refer to behaviors, not what people are. You're using anti-Semitic language, anti-Semitic ideas. Uh, I was in a church recently. It was the second uh, Sunday after Yontif, after uh, after Easter, forgive me. And the gospel reading was blatantly anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish about what the Jews were doing. And I, I said to the uh, rector afterwards, I was a little shocked to see this. I didn't realize, I thought this had been expunged from the lectionary said, yeah, I guess we got work to do. Well, yeah, we do. You know, we, we, we have to keep each other, we have to keep each other honest. Uh, is this guy an anti-Semite? By no means. Does he have an anti-Semitic bone in his body? I don't know. Have I seen his body? Have I done a moral body scan? So getting back to what's going on on campus, I think when our students, when our activists encounter virulent anti-Israel stuff, Israel should not exist. Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. It is important for them to be able to say what that little phrase means. Palestine will be free from the river to the sea means from the Jordan to the Mediterranean, and that means the erasure, yes, the canceling of Israel. 75 years after the creation of the state, I'm not sitting around for that terribly much. Okay? Good. Well, you know, we've all... We've discussed some very easy topics already today. Already. And, and and we have like one minute left. So in the last minute, let me ask, you've been writing for many years. Is there something, what, what, like, what is an article of yours that you wrote that really got the most reaction? And it can, huh. I mean, I'm not, it is maybe not in the content, uh, in, the, in this context of cancel culture, but just, I'm interested to know, like, of all your writings, what, what like, has really pushed a button? Well, the most famous one uh, was uh, a number of years ago in 2016, a number of us believed that a certain presidential candidate should not be addressing APAC, and we organized a protest on that. And uh, we organized a walkout, which was 
singularly ineffective because a hundred of us walked out as this person took the stage. And statistically speaking, in this basketball arena, there were probably a hundred other people getting up to go to the bathroom. It wasn't even noticed. But Don Lemon interviewed me on CNN, and I talked about why there was this rebellion on the part of people uh, responding to this candidate. And the next day, the, uh, the, the, the phones at my synagogue were lighting up like a defective Christmas tree. Not that I know what a defective Christmas tree looks like. And there were resignations, and the board stood by me. Uh, there were some people who said the rabbi shouldn't be commenting on politics, which basically is just a shorthand way of saying the rabbi shouldn't say anything that I disagree with. So, by the way, I was called a couple of weeks ago for another comment by CNN on DeSantis' uh, trip uh, to Israel. I said to the reporter, I got to tell you something. The last uh, person from CNN who interviewed me was Don Lemon. We can have this conversation, but you do so at your professional peril. And he laughed. So. <laughs> I have a new book that will be coming out in January called um, Repairing Our People, which is an analysis of the trends in liberal Judaism non-Orthodox Judaism and asking, how do we turn this ship around? It's going to be interesting. Great. Well, we look forward to having you back on maybe on the book and many other topics. I appreciate your time today, your teaching. Um, and... It's always fun to hang out with you all. And thank you. Yeah, you know, it's a let, small group, you know. Let, let me say the following. I know how busy you all are. I also know that you all have many things that could be occupying your time today. And I am grateful. I don't take this for granted. I am really, really, um, uh, I'm really grateful that you took the time to hang out with me and perhaps learn about some things that forced us to grow. The, the most important thing about Jewish study is I don't have to agree with you. I can actually think that you're a total jerk, but I'm still your friend and I'm still part of your people and I'm committed to keeping us as one people. I don't want to be the guy who pulls on the thread of the talit and watches the whole thing unravel in his hands. Thank you. Amen to that. Happy Thursday, everybody. Happy Thursday. Shabbos, Shabbos, Shabbos is Shabbos. almost here. Yeah. Take care. Be safe. Thanks. Nice to see you. If you're new to CSP, welcome. Thank you all. You see us. you again, I hope. Bye. Uvaho, nice to see you as well. Take care. Bye, Lisa Siegel. Okay, everybody. Yes, Faith, I see you too. Bye. You Bye, are everybody. seen. Okay. Bye, Rabbi Salkin. Talk to you Bye. soon.